if you hang around the same kind of gaming circles I do, there's one company that you likely hear about far too often, and that is Rockstar Games. Nowadays, Rockstar is known for a lot of things, making some of the greatest and best-selling games of all time, especially in the 2000s, and making some of the most influential games of all time, while eventually slipping into complacent and recycled designs, little to no new and innovative releases, and in many cases putting way too much emphasis on microtransactions. But if those complaints sound familiar, it's because those are also the complaints many have had with gaming in general over the last decade. Although, I see a particularly strong parallel between the plight of Rockstar and that of racing games. Actually, around the time many consider to be the peak of both, Rockstar made their own racing game. And for a time, it was arguably the best one on the market. Let's start at the beginning. Not of Midnight Club, but of the people who made it. Angel Studios was formed in 1984 for the purpose of making and progressing the field of 3D computer graphics, primarily in different forms of media like films, music videos, and eventually video games. They started with animated music videos and advertisements for various clients, but eventually expanded to the world of video games, working on such legendary titles as Echo the Tides of Time, Ken Griffey Jr.'s Slugfest, and my personal favorite, Mr. Bones. Now she has no body, and I have no skin. Oh, oh it could work out! It could happen! <laughs> 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 oh, you old lecherous, you old lecherous bastard, you. But after working partially on titles for various developers, they got the attention of Microsoft and would partner with them to make Midtown Madness, an open world racing game set in Chicago, which was a novel concept in the world of racing games at the time, both having an open world that the player could explore and eventually learn well enough to find the best routes to win races in, and to have that map be based on a real-life location, although heavily simplified. It also did fairly well critically and commercially, which drew the attention of Rockstar Games, a then-new publisher recently acquired by Take-Two Interactive. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Rockstar was sucking up studios left and right to work on games for them, the two most notable being DMA Design Limited, creators of the GTA franchise and later renamed to Rockstar North in 2002, and Rockstar San Diego, creators of the Red Dead and Smuggler's Run franchises. Although, before being bought and renamed by Rockstar, they did finally get to iterate on the ideas laid out in Midtown Madness. In the late 90s and early 2000s, tuner culture began springing up across major cities in the US, mainly taking inspiration from the designs and performance enhancements of Japanese tuners and shops from around the same time. Seeing this trend steadily increasing in popularity, Angel Studios made their next racing game focused on this rising subculture. And in November 2000, we got Midnight Club. Now I know this game is very important in the development of open world racing games going forward, and at the time this was received pretty well by critics and consumers, but it has not aged well. I'm not even saying it's necessarily bad, just very primitive and outdated. The main gameplay loop consists of you finding a driver to challenge, having to follow that driver to the exact opposite end of the map you found them on, thankfully the maps aren't that big, and then beating them in a race. You can then either call them to challenge them to a pink slip race and get a better car, or repeat the previous process to progress the game further. This idea in and of itself is fine, 
but it's how it's executed that makes it at best inefficient and at worst actually annoying. The characters themselves don't bring much to the table, although they do bring a signature feature that Midnight Club games would have in every main installment going forward. That is, the racers themselves would talk to the player during the race. I think they want your autograph. This adds some character to the opponents that the game desperately needs, as the character everywhere else is sorely lacking. The music in the game is okay, and pretty decent for my drum and bass and trance enjoyers out there. Sorry I'm not one of them, I'm really more of an Italo disco and house kind of guy. Although, compared to the music, the art direction and graphics really don't hold up all that well. The art direction is sparse, with the menus and general design of the game being very basic and arcade machine-like. And the graphics just don't look that good for a game from 2000. Because this is what Ford Racing and NFS Porsche Unleashed looked like at the time, and if you think it's unfair to compare it to PC games, here's Test Drive Le Mans and Metropolis Street Racer running on the Dreamcast, a less powerful console. In comparison, Midnight Club 1 looks surprisingly flat and blocky. The racing itself also isn't that engaging either, as the opponents don't really challenge the player with their racing ability, but that doesn't mean this game is easy, very much the opposite actually. The Midnight Club games as a whole have quite a reputation for being very difficult, and the first one is no exception. The racers themselves have zero spatial awareness of the player, so they are very likely to push you straight off the road or into buildings. The traffic AI have the same lack of awareness, so they will very often drive directly into you. And the police... exist. Yeah, you'd expect the police to be more of a contributing factor to the game's difficulty, but surprisingly no. They only appear in certain events and usually don't impact a race result outside of maybe slowing all the drivers down for a moment. The driving actually has more of an impact on the difficulty than the police do, as the physics feel very weird coming from more modern arcade racers. The key to racing well in Midnight Club is managing your momentum, and I'll give you three main tips for this. One, your car's forward momentum, unlike every other racer, isn't based on your car's forward momentum. It's based on how fast the transmission is spinning. And I worded that very specifically because what I mean is, if you're going 90 miles per hour and then you slam into the wall on your side, you're going to start accelerating faster than if you were to hit it from a dig. This can be used to your advantage when taking corners in cars with worse handling, but it can also lead to this. Two. The handbrake is your best friend. Almost all the cars understeer immensely, and because of what I said before about momentum, your best solution in many cases is to rip the handbrake and slide into the turn, making it way easier. In three, this game can be a bit inconsistent with its physics. For a while, I thought this game had functional mechanical damage, but that's just because of moments like this. This was not fun for me, but that doesn't mean you might not have fun with it. More than a few people talk positively about this game, and from what I've heard, the multiplayer and arcade modes are actually pretty good fun. I wouldn't know, I never owned the game physically and I'm playing this on an emulator alone in my room. But two years after Midnight Club Street Racing, Rockstar would buy out Angel Studios and rename them to Rockstar San Diego, and a year later, they released their first title under the new name. Midnight Club 2 improves on the original in basically every way. To start, the game looks way better across the board, both in-game and in its presentation with the menus, the visual atmosphere, and the music being leagues ahead of where it was in the first game. It also has a lot of character to its characters, both by increasing the number of unique characters you interact with from 6 to 28, and also giving each one of them a unique animated FMV cutscene before and after each race, as well as having more dialogue during the races. 
you'll run into such kooky characters as the average Frenchman, American Stereotype, and Woman, all of whom think they are the coolest person to walk the earth. That is, until you beat them and they try to sound cool while they give you the keys to their car. Speaking of the races, this is where things get really interesting. As some of you may know, Midnight Club as a series has a history of being ball-crushingly difficult. That history started here, because Midnight Club 2, with few exceptions, is the single hardest racing game I've ever played. Now, those of you that haven't played it before may be questioning why that is. See, since Midnight Club is and always has been firmly an arcade racer, its difficulty doesn't necessarily come from its physics. Well, it does, but I'll get to that. So its difficulty doesn't necessarily come from hyper-realistic physics. So where does it come from? Here, I'll give you an example. Midnight Club 2 doesn't feel difficult to drive like this. Because he lost them, finally. Or even this. Six right of a dip, opens keep middle of a jump at 80, flat right into six left, extra long, opens double one. It feels more like... Midnight Club 2 likes to throw so much random bullshit at you to the point that some events, no, scratch that, some specific races can take hours just to beat. This comes from many different factors and also comes in three distinct levels, which you experience in each of the three different maps in the game. Los Angeles is a good starter map. It familiarizes you with the intricacies of the handling and the game's mechanics, while also giving you a slight taste of the difficulty. LA is a good teaching ground for how the game functions. Like how the AI traffic cars have zero regard for human life, both yours and their own, so they will actively drive into you if you're coming up on them in front of an intersection, making them officially the most annoying character in gaming history to never say a single word. You also learn quickly that on tracks where you don't have to hit the checkpoints in a set order, the AI usually pick a pretty good route, but they don't always pick the best route, which massively increases the player's sense of freedom and accomplishment when they take a route that none of the other racers thought of, and it ends up being quicker. That'll come in handy a lot when you leave LA and move on to Paris. Paris is where the game starts really cooking with the difficulty. The AI become both faster and more sporadic, the traffic seems to be three times denser than in LA, which I don't think is accurate, and the map itself becomes much tighter, much more dynamic in terms of setting and structure, and also has more changes in elevation than LA, making it a much trickier beast. Paris is really where the game starts to test the player in every way. It's where you find out how good you really are at racing games, and also find out if you unfortunately have been diagnosed with skillless ischialitis, making it nigh impossible to progress if you just suck. But if you manage to beat everyone in France, you can finally move on to the game's final area, Tokyo. Tokyo is where the game says, okay, you've had your fun, time to die. Tokyo races are legitimately some of the most difficult races I've ever done in a video game before. Like, GT2 Mission A4, the North American version? Underground 1 Kurt's Killer Ride? F-123 Williams Only Monaco on 110 difficulty? Nah, Tokyo's harder. Actually no, Tokyo starts out not that bad, as the first couple races are actually easier than the last few in Paris. But then you get introduced to stuff like the backtracking checkpoints, the bus blockade, and whatever this is. All of which combine with faster AI, longer races, and even tighter streets, which make this exponentially harder. And the final race? Ugh. Like, here. This is the layout for the first race against the Paris champion. Looks simple enough, right? Well, it took me 35 minutes to beat, and somehow longer than the second race. Alright, this is what the final race against the world champion looks like. Actually, because I never had this game growing up, and because I wanted this video to come out in a reasonable time, I am still yet to face the final boss, Savo. So, if you do want to see that, I guess I might do it on stream if enough people really want to see it. Outside of the immense difficulty, in terms of premise, this game really isn't all that different from Midnight Club 1, 
as in it takes all the ideas from Midnight Club 1 and actually does them well. Although there were some new additions like the online mode, which was a first for the series, although the servers were taken down in 2014, and the game being released on both PS2 and Xbox, and also PC, which weirdly enough, this would be the only Midnight Club to get a PC release which I think is really unfortunate because I would have loved to have played this next game natively on PC. Midnight Club 3 was another massive step up from its predecessor. As much as those who might think that Midnight Club 2 is the best will disagree with me, I think the jump in quality from Midnight Club 2 to 3 was almost as big as the jump from 1 to 2. And although there are many factors that contributed to that progress, I'd say the biggest one was the shift in focus for the game. If I were to sum up Midnight Club 3 in one word, it would be freedom. Not just because this is the only Midnight Club solely to be set in America, no I didn't forget you, but also because every part of this game gives the player more choices and freedoms on how they want to tailor their experience to their preferences. This is immediately noticeable in the career progression, with the player being given the choice of several different categories of car, all with their own unique characteristics, as well as events limited to just that type of vehicle like tuners, muscle cars, luxury sedans, various kinds of bikes, etc. And the game lets you choose between random races dispersed around the map, specific rivals that when beaten will allow you to challenge specific car clubs that race a certain type of car, and championships, which usually allow the player to win a new type of car and expand their garage's variety. And variety is something this game has a lot of in both event types, adding a new one to the series in the autocross and track events, basically restricting the player to a track racing style street circuit where they're either racing against the clock or against other players directly. I actually used to think this was one of the hardest event types growing up, but coming back to it now, it's actually one of the easiest. They also added something new to help players in more difficult events, that being special abilities in the form of zone, a sort of matrix-like slowdown effect obtained by driving cleanly in a race and limited to tuners, exotics, and sport bikes, aggro, an effect that makes every car around you crumple the moment you drive into them, which you refill from smashing objects on the roadside and which is limited to SUVs and luxury sedans, and roar, which is sort of like a shockwave disrupting all the cars and traffic around you which you refuel by drifting, and is limited to just muscle cars and choppers. Another area where the player freedom is reinforced, and this is a big one, was in the customization. They were all in on making a very in-depth customization system, as they went from only being able to change the color of your car in Midnight Club 2, to having the choice of 20 different bumpers, side skirts, and spoilers, the ability to install a carbon fiber hood, tons of rim options, different tire styles and profiles, the ability to adjust suspension heights and tire dimensions, a paint and livery editor, the ability to paint your exhaust, and a bunch of other stuff that's way too long to list. But suffice to say, this was a very in-depth customization system for its time that even some modern games are still missing elements from. I can tell they were definitely gunning for Need for Speed Underground 2 in terms of the depths that they go to to get that kind of customization, and in my opinion, they arguably do it better than Underground 2 did. This game also changes from Midnight Club 2 in how it handles difficulty. In that game, more than a few races could take an average or even a skilled driver a dozen attempts before they could beat it. In this game, most events would take a fraction of the number of attempts to beat, not saying the events were easy, just that they were less random and a little bit more predictable. And when you did screw up, it was often much easier to recover from. This lower difficulty, combined with the fact that there were more races in Midnight Club 3 than in 2, meant that the player felt like they were making a lot more progress than in 2. Like in my case, while playing through both of them for this video, I would often spend much longer in one given session on this than I would MC2. Not only because of the more straightforward progression, but also because of everything around it, like the game's immaculately crafted atmosphere. Like I mentioned earlier, 
This was the only Midnight Club game to take place fully in America, except for the Tokyo campaign that was on the remix, but I'll get to that in a minute. And this game really feels like American car culture, and to an extent culture in general, circa 2005. The music was finally more varied, with rock, rap, reggae, and electronica being the notable genres represented, with the hip-hop tracks in particular taking center stage in this game, especially the Crunk and Dirty South producers of the 2000s. I actually really like this aspect in particular, as it relates to me being right in the middle of the heartland of these kinds of rappers and producers. While Midnight Club 2 felt like going to a rave in a Western European country until midnight, Midnight Club 3 felt like going to an Atlanta club and turning up till 4 in the morning. And speaking of Atlanta, it featured as one of the game's three cities, with it being the music and car culture center of the game, San Diego being the representation for the West Coast scene as well as Ground Zero for tuner culture in the late 90s, and Detroit, the home of the American automobile. This game also made these cities look great for 2005, and as a whole, the menus and visual presentation really tied the game together. This game also was the first Midnight Club to get a port for the PSP, featuring nearly all the same content as the original, although to get all of that content onto a portable device, they had to downgrade the graphics, make the frame rate not necessarily consistent, and make the load times longer than it takes me to make a video. Although, despite this, it did somehow become the best-selling version of the game. Not sure how that happened. Although a year after the main release, we did get Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition Remix, which was an updated version of the game which featured more cars, more customization, more music, and even a new Tokyo Challenge progression, which let you race a slightly updated MC2 Tokyo map and eventually rise up the ranks of Tokyo's street racing scene. Funnily enough, this would also be my introduction to the series on Xbox in 2006. I even still have my original copy right here. Damn, is it scratched up. Guess that's from all the time I put into it, because this was genuinely one of the greatest racing games I played at the time, and it still holds up amazing today. If you haven't played Midnight Club 3, I highly recommend you try it out, whether that's getting a physical copy or emulating it like I have here. But along with Midnight Club 3, I would also recommend getting its successor, because in some ways, it might be even better. The game. In mid-2004, EA bought out the British game development studio Criterion Games, who at that time were mainly known in the public for their recent Burnout games, which were a mix of arcade racing and car combat destruction derby style carnage. But behind the scenes, they were very well known in gaming in general for developing the Renderware engine. Now, that name may sound familiar to you, but in case it doesn't, Renderware was one of the most powerful and popular game engines that developers built their games on in the early to mid 2000s. You had Burnout 3 Takedown, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, The Incredibles, Manhunt, Battle for Bikini Bottom, Dragon Ball Online, Frogger Ancient Shadow, Cod Finest Hour, Mortal the Kombat Italian Armageddon, John, RPM NBA 2, Ballers, Pez Soccer Rayman 6, M. Basically, if you played more than three games during the early to mid 2000s, you probably played something running on Renderware. And the reason I bring this up is because some of the most notable games to be made with this engine were those from Rockstar. Namely, Bully, the first Manhunt, and the first three 3D GTA games. Meaning, Rockstar relied heavily on this engine to make some of their best games. After EA bought the rights to both Criterion and their engine, Rockstar decided they had to stop using an engine that was now owned by one of their competitors. But instead of licensing a different engine from another company, they decided to make it completely in-house. And after some deliberation, they decided to take the Angel game engine, which Rockstar San Diego had been using, and rebuild it to turn it into the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, or the Rage Engine for short. This would go on to be Rockstar's primary development engine going forward, with Max Payne 3, GTA 4, and 5, and both Red Deads being developed using this engine. Although before it became Rockstar's driving workhorse, its creators got to test it out on their best franchise.
Midnight Club Los Angeles was the first Midnight Club to be made for 7th gen consoles, and was also the third game to use the new Rage engine after a table tennis test game and GTA 4. And you can really see that power on display because even today, this game still looks great. Or at least looks like it came out at the end of the 7th gen rather than only three years in. Side note, this weird dithering effect and the fact that some of the daytime footage has weird green and red lighting on the sides of the cars is due to the footage being emulated. This wasn't a thing in the base game. Although, as much as I like the game, I think it might have been hindered slightly by the freshly minted engine, because, to my knowledge, this is the buggiest of the console Midnight Clubs. Notable bugs include the map often having very severe texture pop-in with the player having to drive for seconds or in some cases a full minute before the level of detail in the textures would fix itself. Another somewhat common bug was where sometimes when entering the garage or cutscene areas, your car would shine with the light of a thousand suns, and the online mode has basically always been filled with hackers and cheaters. Although, as of now, the only version of the game with working multiplayer is the Xbox 360 version and its subsequent porting to the Xbox One and Series X. But despite its relatively minor shortcomings on a purely mechanical level, it holds up amazingly well on just about all other fronts. The graphics, as mentioned before, were quite good, only beat by the game's immaculate atmosphere. I know I've mentioned it a lot in this video, but I really want to reiterate just how well Midnight Club 3 in LA craft a vibe that is nearly unmatched 15 years later. This vibe is also assisted by the soundtrack which, and I'll probably get some flack for this, I personally think is better than Midnight Club 3's. There are just so many great artists on here like Kid Cudi, ASAP Rock, Nas, Nine Inch Nails, Beck, MGMT, Justice, Tech 9 The Chemical Brothers, Snoop Dogg, Wolfgang Gartner, and a bunch of others. Here's a few of my favorites. No hay manera de que puedas parar esto, como un corrido, acuera regresado con un nuevo sonido, empezar a hacer feria en manera... I made some good friends that make me say I really want to be in LA Real nigga get his chain snatches back in the morning Not by nightfall might be all out war why everybody out here rapping on killing sprees But face them and they shaking like they naked in 10 degrees I actually first heard Kid Cudi, Tech 9 MGMT, and Justice while playing this game for the first time. Another area this game excels at, which is often very poorly done in other racing games, often to comedic or ironically comedic levels, is the story. Now, sure, it's no Homer's Enemy, it's no Sopranos, it's no Breaking Bad. But especially compared to the string of overacted, underbaked Need for Speed stories we got around this time, this is surprisingly good. And no disrespect to those games, it just, if you don't have the nostalgia for them like I do, they do seem kind of... Sit down! How you been? Okay. In terms of base gameplay, there was also some major changes between this and 3. The physics were changed dramatically, so now the cars feel a bit less twitchy when compared to 3, but that also means that they can feel a bit sluggish and difficult to drive in some corners, especially the heavier and older cars. Speaking of difficulty, I would probably describe this as the easiest of the four entries, but with two big caveats. One being that, at launch, this game was much more difficult. Apparently so much so that Rockstar actually went on to patch the game to make it a bit easier. And because I got LA's equivalent to 3's Remix Edition, this time called the Complete Edition, that patch was already applied when I started playing. And two, this is the Midnight Club I have the most time with, so this is the one I'm most used to in terms of physics and mechanics. Although, I also remember struggling a bit with it when I was a kid. They also changed the abilities, so now instead of having the useless one, the useless one that looks cool, and zone, you now have a new ability, EMP. Oh, no! Which basically sends a power surge through all the cars near you, 
and now you can apply any ability to any car instead of them being car type specific. Although many still say Zone is the best in LA, and it probably is, I think EMP can work depending on your driving style. Basically, Zone is the best defensive ability, while EMP is the best offensive ability. They also overhauled the customization system, although not all the changes they made were positive. They got rid of most of the body customization options and replaced them with ones that were more... unique? But they also gave you a much better livery and paint editor, allowed you to apply a wide body kit to most cars, and even let you fully customize your interior, which is still very impressive today. And you can show off those new designs and body mods with one of the new multiplayer modes, Rate My Ride, which let the player look at other player-created designs and cars, as well as rate and buy a replica of them. This led to some... interesting designs, if you can call it that, but as a whole it was an interesting feature to add to the series. Speaking of the multiplayer, this is actually the only game in the series that I've played the multiplayer form. I would show you me actually playing it, but the only footage I have of it is from October 2016, and it looks like this. So I guess I'll just show others online footage. The multiplayer as a whole was improved a bit between 8 and 3, but seeing as I'm less familiar with 3s, I can't fully comment on it. What I can say is, I did have some genuinely good racing with some of the players I ran into at that time, and even got to try some of the weird power-up events, which to me looked less like Midnight Club and more like Rip-Off Blur. And many of these lobbies were filled with obnoxious and abrasive hackers who would usually just shoot themselves at you and teleport to the finish line rather than race. But that could also be down to the fact that I was playing this game nearly 8 years after its release, because at that point, it was pretty apparent that Rockstar had basically abandoned Midnight Club in any major capacity. Although at the time, all still seemed well for the first couple years after Midnight Club LA released. Immediately after the console release, we got another PSP game, this time called Midnight Club LA Remix, which is the best way to play Midnight Club on PSP. And also is the only game in the series to not just feature Tokyo, but actually feature the Midnight Club Street Racers that the game is named after, and lets you race against them to be the best in Tokyo. And also like Midnight Club 3, LA got its own expanded version, this time called LA Complete Edition, which came with its aforementioned difficulty patch, as well as a first for the series, a downloadable DLC. In this case being a map and story extension called South Central which also included a solid handful of new cars, two new car types, and another soundtrack expansion. But this is actually where the problems for the series begin. In early January 2010, a large number of wives of Rockstar San Diego employees under the pseudonym Rockstar Spouse posted to the Gama Sutra blogs alleging that the working conditions of the company had been sharply declining over the last year. This also happened to coincide with when the studio's main projects were the South Central expansion for Midnight Club and the upcoming release of Red Dead Redemption. This wasn't super widely covered at the time, but this is strongly linked to some of the studio's more established talent leaving around that time, many of whom were instrumental in the development of Midnight Club LA, and were in the process of developing Midnight Club 5. But at the time, very few people thought anything was awry at the company, and assumed the new Midnight Club was just a few years away like it had always been after the last one. But in the years that would follow, different factors led to the development of Midnight Club 5 stopping indefinitely, the biggest one being the absolutely insane success of GTA 5. If you look at Rockstar's release schedule leading up to GTA 5, you'll see that they started increasing production as they acquired more studios in the early 2000s, then were very slowly decreasing production heading into the 2010s, as games became larger and harder to develop on 7th gen consoles, then GTA 5 came out, and they haven't done a single other full release since, not including ports with the exception of Red Dead Redemption 2. And it's not like they did it for no reason, GTA 5 was and still is one of the most profitable games ever made becoming the second best-selling game of all time, only behind Minecraft. But I don't even know if Minecraft is as straight-up profitable as GTA V, because with the modern monetization practices that are in that game, I can see the argument to be made that GTA is the more profitable one. 
And those monetization practices are half of the reason why I'm not sure a Midnight Club 5 would be good even if we did get it. The other half being Rockstar's reputation in the last few years, especially when it comes to how they treat their most beloved older titles. Just look at Red Dead 1 on Switch or the GTA Remastered trilogy for examples. When I asked you guys whether or not you thought a new Midnight Club game would ever happen, I got a resounding no, which, looking at the state of Rockstar and to an extent racing games in general, I'm all but convinced we're never going to see a new Midnight Club. Which is a bit unfortunate, but I can't say that's entirely a bad thing. Because a series like Midnight Club is one of those that's basic premise works best when paired with the trends of the day. And, as we've seen from its surviving competitors trying that exact thing, even if not executed perfectly, racing game fans in general weren't the most receptive to it. So I think that if we did get a new Midnight Club built like how the old ones were, there wouldn't be as much of a market for it, unless it was so much like the originals that it pulls a GTA San Andreas and takes place a decade and a half before the game's release, but I am personally fine with just having the great games we got, because they still have so much to offer today. And to those who haven't played them, you have to try these games. Because we may never see its like ever again. Yeah. And you say Shy City. Shy City. Shy City. I'm coming home again. Do you think about me now? so much so she said excuse me little homie i know you don't know me but my name is wendy and i like to blow trees and from that point i never blow her off niggas come from out of town i like to show her off they like to act tough she like to tone them off and make them straighten up their hat because she know they soft and when i grew up she showed me how to go downtown in the nighttime my face lit up so it's down and i told her in my heart is where she always be she never mess with entertainers because they always leave she said it felt like they walked in drove on me, knew I was gang affiliated, got on TV and told